Hello and welcome to Lifespan Development Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole and today we're going to be going over Chapter 3, Prenatal Development. Let's start with talking about some of the biological foundations of human development. So when we're talking about behavioral genetics, the nature versus nurture debate questions the role of heredity versus environment in our personality. So whenever I refer to anything that is your nature, that's referring to your genetics. And anything that is your nurture is referring to your environmental influences. But it's not considered a nature versus nurture argument today. It should be viewed as an interactionist model, as I've mentioned previously. Um, both your nature, both your genetics, as well as your nurture, your environment, are involved in influencing how you behave and influencing how you develop. So while genetic predispositions are important, other factors are in part the effect of epigenetic above the genome chain changes. So epigenetics describes psychological development as a result of an ongoing bidirectional interchange between heredity and the environment. And behavioral genetics is the science of how genes and environments work together to influence uh, our behavior and can be studied in adoption and twin studies. Those are super interesting to look into. I recommend this documentary called Three Identical Strangers, although uh, the scientific research behind it may be a little bit spotty. I do encourage you, if you just enjoy uh, twin studies or adoption studies, seeing this documentary because it's really eye-opening and just interesting in general, I particularly think. So let's continue with behavioral genetics. So whenever you're talking about twins, since we're on the topic of twins, monozygotic twins occur when a single zygote or fertilized egg splits apart in the first two weeks of development and creates two separate but identical offspring. Now, dizygotic or fraternal twins share the same genetic material as would any other child with the same mother and father. And in the uterus, 60 to 70 percent of monozygotic twins share the same placenta, a temporary organ connecting the fetus to the uterine wall. But separate, excuse me, but separate amniotic sacs, a thin but tough transparent pair of membranes that holds a developing embryo or fetus until shortly before birth. Now we've got conjoined twins, which are, and how that happens is monozygotic twins whose bodies are joined during pregnancy. We also have the concept of vanishing twins, and as many as one in eight pregnancies start out as multiples, but only a single fetus is brought to full term. And with twin studies, a genetic behavior research method uh, is a behavior, a behavior genetic research method that involves a comparison of the similarity of monozygotic and fraternal twins. Super interesting. Now with prenatal development, uh, let's look at the periods of prenatal development. So you've got the first couple weeks, the germinal period. This is where the fertilized egg forms a zygote as a one cell structure. The genetic makeup and sex of the baby are set. During the first week, the, zyg the zygote divides and multiplies through a process of mitosis. So if you've had biology before, then you know this pretty well. And, uh, mitosis happens for about seven to 10 days and has um, about 150 cells that implants into the uterine lining. Now the embryonic period, which happens from weeks three to eight, upon implantation, the multicellular is called an embryo. The placenta, which is a structure, uh, connects, a structure connected to the uterus to provide nourishment and oxygen from the mother to the embryo via the umbilical cord is formed. Now, cells continue to differ differentiate, the heart starts beating, organs begin to form and function. Growth occurs from head to tail and from the midline outward. About 20% of organisms fell during the embryonic periods, about 1 in 5 fell during this period. Now, the fetal period, which happens from 9 weeks to 40, uh, the fetus is about, at about 9 weeks, about the size of a kidney bean, and begins to look human. By 12 weeks, the fetus has all body parts. By 16 weeks, the fetus is about four and a half inches long with fully developed fingers and toes and vi visible fingerprints. Organ systems continue to, to develop and rudimentary neurons in the brain are developed by 24 weeks. The age of viability is reached at about 22 to 26 weeks. By week 37, all of the fetus organ, organ systems are developed enough that it could survive outside the mother's uterus without risks associated with premature birth. Now, it's important whenever we talk about this 
uh, fetal development, the environmental risks. Now, we have all been pretty well informed, hopefully, if we're at the college level, of the concept that, hey, there are a lot of environmental factors that can influence the development of the embryo or fetus. These are what's known as teratogens. So any environmental agent that can cause uh, harm to the, to the fetus, this can include things such as maternal diseases, obviously drugs and alcohol, and even stress, as well as environmental and occupational exposures. So whenever an, uh, a fetus is exposed to high consumption of alcohol, this can lead to the fruition of fetal alcohol syndrome, which can lead to a lot of uh, behavioral, neurocognitive, as well as physical difficulties. So whenever it comes to the physical difficulties of fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, uh, this can lead to like a smooth philtrum, which is like we've got all got this divot on our upper lip, but that becomes smooth with um, fetal alcohol syndrome, as well as a thin upper lip, a flatter mid face, and things like that. Now, when it comes to the cognitive difficulties, this can lead to the fruition of, of ADHD. So there are symptoms of, of ADHD and, and, of course, with the frontal lobe difficulties um, through attention deficit as well as hyperactivity symptoms. So individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome have a higher likelihood of developing ADHD. Now, nicotine... Uh, levels travel through with tobacco, travel through the placenta to the fetus, and has been associated with low birth rate, placenta previa, birth defects, preterm delivery, delivery, fetal growth restriction, and sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS, which is, of course, death within the first uh, 12 months or so uh, from birth. And so this can lead to, uh, or this is due to a number of things um, uh, naturally. So if somebody, uh, or if an infant, uh, unfortunately passes away due to SIDS, um, it can be due to. It's mainly because of the, the stoppage of breathing, and th the stoppage of breathing can be through a number of ways: hyper hyperthermia, uh, overheating. Um, unfortunately, you know uh, the mouth being. Not being covered up as a result of being uh, asleep on on their stomach or sleeping with the uh, parent, things like that. Now, some other environmental risks, obviously, uh, even drugs that are pre uh, prescribed to you, um, even if prescription medication is required, the lowest possible dose should be used because even though you need it as a prescription, it can still cause uh, harm to the developing embryo or fetus. That's not even talking about illicit drugs, which should be super obvious. Not uh, taking, you know, opioids or uh, other other forms of, of drugs that should be avoided, just even with not being pregnant, but uh, will still unfortunately happen from time to time. Where unfortunately infants will be um, born and they will be automatically addicted to a particular substance. That's that's one of the outlets. Of course, it can be uh, physiolo physiologically experienced through like low birth weight. Like I said, the, they'll experience those withdrawal symptoms, birth defects, and then learning and behavioral problems down the road. So even your place of employment or if you live in an environment where there's environmental chemicals, this can be you know, through pollution, organic mercury compounds, herbicides, um, and industrial solvents. Sexually transmitted infections obviously goes without saying, but this can complicate pregnancy and may have serious effects on not just the uh, baby, but the mother as well. Maternal diseases, maternal illness increases the chance that a baby will be born with a birth defect or have a chronic health problem. And then even something such as stress, um, being stressed out because of the link of in blood supply between mother and fetus, stress can leave a lasting effect on the developing uh, fetus. So if you are currently pregnant or know somebody who's pregnant watching this, whoever their partner is, make sure that they're limiting the amount of stress on, on, the, on the mother. So get, make sure to always go and, and support them with, with the cravings and with whatever they want. Okay, that was just kind of uh, a side joke, but 
um, seriously, I, I, uh, whenever it comes to stress, this, this can really impact that developing fetus. So when it comes to maternal mortality, about 830 women unfortunately die from preventable pregnancy or childbirth related complications around the world, not just each year, not just each month, but every day. And almost all maternal deaths, 99%, occur in developing countries. The lifetime risk of maternal death in high income countries is 1 in 3,300 compared to 1 in 41 in low income countries. That is a, a, an astounding statistic, a very heart wrenching statistic, but just to me is mind blowing. So, a pregnancy related death. To define it is the death of a woman while pregnant or within one year of the end of, the, of a pregnancy, regardless of the outcome, duration, or site of the pregnancy, from any cause related to or aggravate, aggravated by the pregnancy or its management. So some top causes of pregnancy-related deaths include cardiovascular disease, non-cardiovascular disease, and infection or sepsis. Now, a spontaneous abortion miscarriage is uh, experienced in approximately 20 to 40 percent of undiagnosed pregnancies and in 10 percent of diagnosed pregnancies and typically occurs before the 12th week. Okay, so now let's talk about birth and delivery. So with the process of delivery, the first stage of labor is typically the long longest with uterine contractions initially lasting about 30 seconds, uh, 15 to 20 minutes apart, but increasing in duration and frequency to more than a minute and three to four minutes apart. So during the first stage, the cervix dilates to 10 centimeters or just under four inches and takes 12 to 16 hours for the first children and six to nine hours for women who have uh, previously given birth. The second stage involves the passage of the baby through the birth canal and takes about 10 to uh, 40 minutes with the head delivering first and the umbilical cord clamped and cut. The third stage is relatively painless when the placenta is delivered and occurs within 20 minutes after the delivery of the baby. Now with a cesarean section, it is the use of surgery to, de to deliver babies and may be necessary when vaginal delivery poses a risk to baby or mother. So that is where we're going to conclude for chapter 3. I will see you in the next one for chapter 4. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.